in our scripture text last week. We read from Acts chapter 17, which told about the experience that Paul and his fellow missionaries had in the city of Thessalonica. Things there had been going great. Many people welcomed the good news of Jesus and were dedicating their lives to God, except there were some religious hardliners who didn't like this new message that Paul was spreading. So they formed an angry mob, dragged some of the new Christians to the town council, and ran Paul out of town. Understandably, Paul was really worried about leaving them. Would they give up following Jesus? Would there be more angry mobs harassing them? Now that Paul's gone, would people try to convince them that Paul was crazy and didn't know what he was talking about or didn't care enough to stick around? Paul was worried about all those things. So he sent Timothy, one of his missionary partners, back to check on the Thessalonians. And Timothy returns to Paul with a great report. They are doing really well. Phew. We can feel the relief that Paul felt. So Paul is very encouraged, and he writes them this letter. Here's a reading from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. From Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering, with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it, for they themselves report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. May God bless this holy word today. Now, it hasn't been too long since Paul left Thessalonica, maybe just less than a year when he wrote this letter back to them. And you can tell that he has a lot of affection for the Thessalonians, even though his visit there was a lot shorter than he had planned. Paul is so glad that they haven't given up, and they're actually flourishing in spite of persecution. Good for them. I'm sure it was not easy for them, especially after Paul had to leave. They would have really had to work hard at it. That's why Paul said in verse 3 that he thanks God for their work produced by faith, their labor prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hmm. Work, labor, endurance. That's a good reminder that strong communities don't come from nowhere. They require real work and effort, labor and faith. And it may not be easy. It may ask a lot of you. It may mean some of the things that we do, like driving across town on a Saturday to help instead of relaxing. It may mean carving out time to check on someone who is lonely and by themselves. It may mean talking with people you don't see eye to eye with. It may mean taking money that you earned and giving it to help people you'll never meet 
It may ask a lot of you. Last Tuesday, we recorded an interview with Eva England as we start collecting stories and memories for our church's 100th anniversary next year. Miss Eva joined our church in 1943, and since it hadn't been too long since the church was founded, she remembers knowing and being with some of our church's charter members and what they were like. She said that she could tell they had really given and sacrificed a lot for our congregation and our community, the dividends of which we are enjoying still today. Often when it comes to historical figures like founding fathers and founding mothers, we tend to idolize them so much that we forget they were real people too, like us, real people with families and responsibilities, and yet they sacrificed and worked to get this church started and going and built. We should be thankful for their labor and their work and their endurance, because strong communities of love require effort and faith. It may not be easy then or now, but nothing worthwhile is easy. We need to remember that because when we think about going through life as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus, as someone who attends a church, we sometimes take it for granted because it's just easy to call yourself a Christian in our society today. You don't have to worry about somebody finding out that you attend a Christian church. In fact, it's not really that big of a deal. We don't face any persecution or harassment because of our faith. We should be thankful for that, but we should recognize it. We don't have to worry about that stuff, but the Thessalonians did. It's likely that before Paul got there, nobody in Thessalonica had ever heard there was a man called Jesus, and that if you followed him, you would have abundant life now and forever, no matter how bad you've been or how many mistakes you'd made. That's the gospel in a nutshell, God's good news, but nobody there knew about it. There were probably no Christians in Thessalonica until Paul and his fellow missionaries show up. So if you were one of the first ones, then you were going to stand out in town. Especially when some angry folks rounded up an angry mob and dragged some of the Christians through the streets. Each person in Thessalonica who decided to accept the salvation Jesus offers, who decided decided to join with the other Christians for support and encouragement, That involved a big change in their lives, and people would have noticed. You couldn't just say you were a Christian, but then not think about it for most of the week. No, if you decided to follow Jesus, it was a big decision that changed the way you acted, the way you thought, the way you treated other people. Being a Jesus follower defined your life. It was true for the Thessalonians back then, And it's true for other parts of the world even now. Take, for example, it's been in the news a lot lately, the country of Afghanistan. Even before the Taliban took over the country last week, if you were a Christian, you did not have it easy. Like in Afghanistan, your religion is put on your ID card. So you really stand out if you're different from everyone else. Most Christians there don't register themselves, or they might check other instead to keep it secret. But two months ago, some Afghan pastors and church leaders made a hard decision. They decided to formally register their faith with the Afghan government and not hide it anymore. It was a dangerous thing to admit even then, but the Afghan church leaders felt compelled to legally declare that they followed the way of Jesus. They said they wanted to make the sacrifice in the hopes 
that maybe their children or their grandchildren would one day be able to do so without any risk. And there may be a day when that happens, but it is not this day. For years, most Christian churches in Afghanistan met in houses, but now they are having to truly hide in small rooms or closets as they hide from the Taliban. I got a message uh, last week informing me of what the situation was like there. One pastor wrote last week, we can't go out, it's too dangerous. Not only am I in danger, but my whole family because of me. Many Afghan pastors have received letters from the Taliban warning them, we know who you are, we know what you do, and where to find you. That is chilling. Few Afghan pastors have been able to escape, and the rest do not believe they will survive the coming weeks. Wow. Think about the strength they have, the courage that it takes them to say, I'm a follower of Jesus. Even the amount of bravery it takes just to go to a Christian church because it risks your life is incredible. You can be sure that if you are a Christian in Afghanistan, it is a really big deal. And it defines your life. If you're a Christian here, out in the world, out in America, in the South, in the Bible Belt, nobody really cares that much. Most people either go to church or they grew up in a church, or at least they'll show up for a holiday or two every once in a while. A lot of people even claim to be Christians but don't really show the love of Jesus at all. It doesn't really matter anyway, since here, being a Christian is no big deal. But that's not good. That's not right. It should be a big deal. If you decide to follow the example and the teachings of Jesus Christ, that should be a really big deal because he told us to do some pretty wild stuff. Things that are so generous and helpful and loving that people would think you're crazy for being so nice. When following Jesus defines your life, then like Paul said in verse 8, the Lord's message will ring out from you. It will cause people to notice. Some will be inspired to turn their lives around and find meaning in their lives. Others, like the Jews in Thessalonica or the Taliban in Afghanistan, they won't like it. The cross of Christ can be a dangerous thing to follow. Make no mistake. That's why 32 years ago, there was a cross in the country of El Salvador that actually got arrested. The cross itself was arrested and put in jail. Back then, in the late 1980s, El Salvador was run by a fierce military government, and the government was so paranoid that they were suspicious of anyone who disagreed with their government policies, anyone who asked questions, any kind of dissent or protests at all. So anyone who was thought to be unsupportive of the government was arrested. They disappeared. It was not a happy place to be. There was a lot of suffering, a lot of oppression, and a lot of poverty. So at one Lutheran church, the people felt helpless to change all of that suffering in their country. But they knew that they could still pray, and they could still confess their sins to God. So what they did, the members of Resurrection Lutheran Church in San Salvador, they made a six-foot-tall cross out of two simple boards that they put together. And one day in worship, they wrote on that cross all the sins of their country. So in Spanish, they wrote things like allowing hunger, unlawful arrests, 
oppression of women, social injustice, and many, many more. The church kept this cross on their altar table as a reminder of things that they needed to help their country change. Well, in November of 1989, special military units were given a list of social leaders who were deemed to be subversives. The pastor of that Lutheran church, Pastor Medardo Gomez, was on the list because he had been preaching dangerous sermons that said things like, God doesn't like it when people are starving, or God doesn't want anyone to suffer, or God doesn't want people to be mistreated. You know, dangerous stuff like that. So he spoke out against the violent, oppressive practices of the El Salvadoran government, which had already killed his Catholic friend, Archbishop Oscar Romero. Fortunately, Pastor Gomez was warned that his life was in danger, so he went to the German embassy for protection. The soldiers, though, went looking for him, stormed into Resurrection Lutheran Church, and arrested the 15 people who were hiding and praying there. And the soldiers saw something else. They saw that cross on the altar with the country's sins written on it. So what'd they do? They arrested the cross too. They actually locked the cross in a prison cell. When the police would interrogate and torture the church members, the cross would be right there in the room with them and the interrogators would point at it and shout, tell us what this means. A good question. Because of the cross, the church members were accused of being subversives. They were accused of being communists. They were accused of trying to overthrow the government. It sounds ridiculous, but it reminds us that the cross of Christ can be dangerous when people follow it. True followers of Jesus run the risk of upsetting others by calling them to a higher standard or by loving people no matter what. So, what happened to that cross, the one that was arrested? Well, thank goodness it does have a happy ending eventually. Pastor Gomez remained protected, so the military squads couldn't find him. The next year, he was able to organize enough international pressure to have his church people freed and make El Salvador's president move the cross out of the prison. Not knowing where one puts something like that, the president just kept it in his office, which is ironic since that's probably the exact person that the people who wrote on the cross were hoping would see it. When the violence ended some time later, Pastor Gomez was finally able to return to his church, and through more help and communication, he was able to convince the president to let the cross return there too, where it still stands today, 32 years later. It stands by the altar of Resurrection Lutheran Church in San Salvador, and it has become known as La Cruz Subversiva, the subversive cross. It reminds all who see it that the way of Jesus is a big deal. So, I encourage you to think about that this week. Think about your life and ask the question, is following the teachings, the example, in the way of Jesus, a big deal for you. Let us pray. Oh God, we confess that too often we have lived the way we want to live, be the way we wanted to be, treat others however we felt like. And we confess that too often we have not made the way of your Son as big a deal as it should be. We have not let it 
truly change our lives from top to bottom, from the inside out. So we pray that you would convict us today and this week. Show us the parts of our lives that we have not let go of, that we have not laid down on your altar table. This week, help us to be real followers. Even if people think we're strange for being so loving and joyful and full of peace. But that is the example of your son. And when we follow it, people will notice. Amen.